uh, let's just leave into it. I'm actually quite excited about what we've done, and hopefully you will be as well. So in general, what we've been up to uh, uh, overall is, first of all, we've been receiving over the last 12 months a lot more uh, data. Uh, so we spent a lot of effort after maybe some uh, a few initial pickups and in figuring out how to streamline this process. I think we now have a, a very streamlined process in place, and uh, we'll go into that in just a moment uh, for accepting data. Um, and uh, so we're really gearing up to be able to do that and to get it integrated. Um, this seems a little bit like one could call it inside baseball, but something what we're calling a high resolution data model. One of the important things for being able to discover data and reuse data is to have it adequately described. And uh, also the ability to integrate data across multiple sources depends on it having to be accurately described. As you know, in the initial rounds of base space, basically you more or less found the data by its description and downloaded a whole bundle of files. Um, we basically exploded that whole model where now we have kind of very detailed descriptions of every piece of data, uh, which allows us to link things together in ways you would expect to connect our data to other people's data uh, and to have a much more enriched navigation and discovery experience. So that turns out maybe is less important to uh, people sitting in this room, but enables us to do, uh, it's enabled us to do all kinds of really interesting things with regards to discovery and a presentation, and we'll see that. It also really sets the groundwork for integration of base-based data and contextualize that against lots of other uh, relevant and related data sets. Um, we spend a lot of work on then integrating, connecting pieces together. So I would say um, with a completely straight face that base base no longer consists of a set of independent data that was distributed by individual folks, but we work really hard to stitch the pieces together. So it looks much more like an integrated data collection. And we'll see examples of that. And that's also connected to the, to the high resolution data model. Uh, and we've also been looking at pushing the ways that you interact with the data, uh, looking at different types of visualizations and presentation methods. And we'll see some nice examples of that. Um, right. Uh, and then we've also, given this new model, we've now also started to integrate with external um, data providers and external data sources. So not so much to replicate those, but to make face space the place where all the data relevant to cranial facial is collected together. So that might include bringing in some of that external data or creating links to that external data. And we'll show you kind of the first example of that with the Tino grid. And uh, but we've got other, uh, I think, which are going to be really compelling I think the integrations of linkages in mind. We're talking to other groups already and how we can help them. I'll just kind of for two cents, it's my curious sitting in the front here. And one of the reasons why we can do this is that we've also underneath this, there's a very robust, extensible, bigger platform for doing data integration, collection, and data curation. So this gives us the ability to do very rapidly. And in fact, this is the same platform on the impact as well. All right, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. So let's just start. Um, we're going to do it in this order. This will make Steve happy. Um, so this notion of uh, face space being useful to the community. So we spent some time looking at. We have been collecting a lot of Google Analytics data over the past 12 months. It's not in a, a very accessible format right right now. So we have to do some manual. Um, tweaking of this data, we, we are in the process of deploying a new kind of real-time analytics system, so we'll get much better insight in real time as to what's going on. But uh, so here's the statistics we have, and I, I don't think these are too bad. So if we look at um, the data, what you'll see is this is uh, one of the things we did this this year to help increase the throughput is we have a three-stage operation model. Um, from everyone here, the feedback we got was as soon as we get a view, it would be great to see it, even if it's not totally useful. So we now have a step where data is ingested. It, um, it is ingested and nothing has happened. It's in the pending state. We then um, put it in release state where we do a minimal amount of curation, basically the base base one level curation. And then we do the more detailed drill down and then it's curated. Um, and so what you'll see here is that currently there are no data sets in the pending state. 
you know, the, the large number that are in the release state, not the curated state, are the historic based phase one data for the most part. Um, and so our intention is not to go back and recurate that more or less. So we can just basically insert it bit without that drill down. And then we have 64 data sets, which is have, have actually gone through the full detail curation process. Um, and so this new three-stage curation method seems to be working quite well. It, it meets the goals of getting stuff into the hands of the community as soon as possible, while then allowing us time to do the bio curation uh, on that data. Um, and so we're pretty pleased with that. We'll uh, tomorrow we'll hear about a whole new set of submission and curation tools that will even further streamline this process to make it even easier for people to get data in and to make sure that it's correct and annotated. So that's the statistics on the data set. So um we're writing for you. Um so a brief summary of what, what we've got is so we've got a total count of 708 data sets. So those are these conditions. We've got 1,100 curated samples and 4,600 curated assays and a total of, uh, in addition, uh, 2,300 additional files. So that's what's currently in the face based data set now. And what you'll see is actually these statistics are all available in real time through our dashboard in the browser. So, so this stuff you can all get to uh, by yourself. This is a little bit hard to get to, but if you look at the traffic, uh, again, I, I would say this is pretty respectable. Can give you some comparisons as to why I would say this is helpful. We see that there's a growth that has gone on from year to year. So we'll see this year we have um, 42,000 page views. An average session duration, we can argue about the definition of what a session is and how a duration is measured. Um, but we're using pretty much industry standard mechanisms for this. Uh, so we've got about a six minute session duration, which again is pretty respectable. We've seen a, a, a total of 7,900 users. Unique. Sessions and there's a that I won't go into. And 60% of the people are um, the side of return. And so, with regard to industry standards, um, these are all prospective measures. You can see how the phase is going. Um, uh, obviously, we want to spend a lot of time this year trying to drive up all these numbers uh, as much as possible and doing that through both combinations of outreach and then we're in a position to do much more detail usage analysis of uh, what exactly people are doing on the site. Uh, so we're, we're working really hard driving that up. I think it's also worth mentioning our goal here with base base is not to drive downloads. Um, our goal is to drive knowledge capture. So we're really um, been focusing a lot on enriched presentations, enriched data, and uh, enriched interaction with the site. And so one of our challenges is to capture people Go to the site, do some of the visualizations, discover new things, then leave without downloading anything. Um, so, in this case, uh, things like session duration and path to the site are going to be important. So, we've got the tools in place now where we can measure those things. Uh, okay, and then the last statistics site. Oh, here's another interesting point. We have 305 registered registered. So we have 305 registered users. We've had in the data browser 200 plus whole data set downloads per month. That's actually a And we've had uh, 1750 plus images. We have a number of people with pictures. The other really interesting thing is one of the things we've done over the past uh, year is we've got much better provisioning tag up, so we have everything on the tag up now, all the base-based data. 
Yeah, we're seeing a non trivial amount of time the leaders back up. So, 2012 is over 180 lines Those numbers are a little bit funny because you don't download the full file, you pull pieces out of it. Um, so, again, I think that's um, pretty respectable. One of the things we'll also talk about today is we're going towards an embedded genome track browser, so we're not going to rely on something we're going to track. And we think there's some compelling presentation and integration issues for uh, reasons for doing that. So, we'll show you in a second. so overall, this is what we've seen over the past year. Um, we haven't done detailed analysis of which data sets and exactly what people are doing. And there's all kinds of other things we can discover going forward. But uh, this is kind of a high level view, and I would say it's not, it's pretty useful. So, that's our usage. So now let's go to the fun stuff. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question was how did we normalize these data to take out these based researchers? And so let's see, I know we filtered out uh, internal use. Did we filter out the base base? We have uh, filtered out of users, so we have not entirely filtered out all of the spokes. Some we definitely filtered out from say the downloads from the Google Analytics. That's hard to do because they don't actually track the uh well, we don't link it to an actual identity. So the privacy issues and filter out free that they'll make that but downloads. Yes, yeah, so, the, so the answer is some yes, some no. With, with the new analytics we're putting in place, we'll be able to do a much better job of filtering out face based internal users. As Rob was pointing out, Google actually, by default, they essentially de identify all the data. So it's difficult to um, Google Analytics to figure out exactly who's doing what. We're putting in place a new privacy policy, which should be up and um, new analytics system where we're actually tracking everything every user does. So. It's basically a big brother. So uh, that's that's where we're going to improve the resolution of the analysis. Any other questions? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a brief tour through some of the new old stuff, of the new cool stuff that we have. And then Rob is going to give you, uh, we're going to really risk it here and do a live demo from the production site. And hopefully you can see uh, some of this stuff in action. So. I'll try to be brief and uh, difficult for me, I know, and then we'll look at the real stuff. So as we said, we have a new, uh, new data model. It's much more detailed the relationship between samples and experiments and different types of pathways and the genes and how all things connect up together. This allows us to do kind of interesting things on which are hopefully um, uh, compelling and useful. Um, We've done a multi-migration Very slick, and it's going to be a little bit of a lot of the 
of samples, assays, and files. They're all kind of linked together, and they're linked to the components at each level. For example, species, one of the gene name, things like that. Uh, and and uh, so now the data comes in and curated into the model. We have to consider our policies. We can pull out what are the samples, what are the genes, what are the assays. They all work together in a single way. And then the, the nice thing about CAD is once it's done, it gives us the ability to kind of slice and dot us. So we look for all the samples, or all on all the projects, or everything related to anatomy, or everything related to the phenotype. So it gives us lots of different ways of doing the data. Uh, and we'll go through this interactively, but you can see here, here is a, what do we got here? So here we've got a display, hard to see. See, no, I can't even see it here. But uh, we have the list of samples, the list of imaging assays, and a list of files associated with uh, this must be uh, with a particular uh, data set. Um, so this is the new model. Uh, so we're quite excited about that. And what that allows us to do is then this, this very interesting role of navigation. So here's an example of where um, we're, we've collected together um, images. And then the samples that generated those images, and then the assays, the actual files that were associated them. And so this is all generated dynamically from the model. So nobody's going through and curating or like connecting these things to things. So we're, we're really using terms and the ontologies to connect the pieces together. And then we can dynamically aggregate and generate different pieces of data. And we think this is going to be really useful for the teaching community. And so they increase curation around phenotype, the structure of the model that allows us to represent the science more directly. Um, and then the tooling that we use to move this all together. And so we'll see examples of that. But uh, our, our hope is that this is going to be incredibly useful. Um, we've created a data set dashboard where we have a concise and searchable um, reference of all the data sets that are base based. So we just go in and we get roll ups. So we can see exactly what's going on. That text must be completely unreadable at the back of the room because I can't even see it here. Um, I'm sorry? Yes, yes, exactly. There's actually no data sets here at all. So, uh, yeah, well, you can go and see this yourself, but this also allows you as investigators to track the status of your data so you can determine if, you, if we're sharing the love with regards to curation. Um, so, this is all available to you. Um, the other thing we've done, um, this seems like a silly little thing, but it's actually pretty cool, is we've integrated projects into the database as well. So we are explicitly modeling every project in the database. And um, 
all of the investigators in the project. And what this allows us to do is do data set specific rollups. So now it's dynamic to create a project page for you, which will tell you here's the project, who's involved with it, here's all the data sets that are currently submitted in the state that are ready. So now Steve, that's on you. Uh -huh. But um, so, you know, depending on something comes and says, oh, I want to find all the data from this event here. I want to find all the data from this project. I want to find all the data from this project. I want to find the data from this team. Because we can do these linkages and rollups. We can easily present all the information that we actually do. Um, here's the example of the phenotype summary. So, as I said, we had gone through and recreated the data. Uh, we agreed on an appropriate set of phenotype terms. Uh, we've recreated the data with the appropriate phenotype. And then what we've done is we've linked that against the monarch um, uh, ontology. So what you're seeing here, and again, we'll show you this live, is an integration of the monarch phenotype of the browser into a base-based page. So this is our first example of where we're bringing real value proposition to base space by integrating with external sources to enrich the data that you've produced. So here, We'll see, we're looking at, um, this is small maxilla uh, or some mouse data. And oh, here's the, on the bottom here, you can see we've got the data sets have this particular uh, uh, anatomical name. And then what we've done is we've linked in all the phenotype we have associated with that through um, uh, uh, Monarch. And then from here, we can find related phenotype to the other things the disease because this links against uh, diseases as well. So now this starts to link us up with, with other things going outside in the universe. And we'll probably look at doing a tighter integration than what we've done here, but this is a really uh, was a critical first step. Um, this phenotype integration in some ways previously they were off to the side a bunch of pages um, that described what we had on each gene, and they were really beautiful, but they were disconnected and unsearchable, uh, therefore kind of lost. So we've gone through and recurated them as data elements as well. So now here is data which you're familiar with, but now rolled into the data browser and linked in. So we can click from here, for example, to all the data we had on that particular gene. Um, we, uh, we'd like to further disaggregate this to make it even more searchable, but I'm um, not sure whether we'll do that or not. So, for example, here we have multiple age stages embedded in. I don't think we've got this indexed by developmental stage. Right. So, we've completely integrated in these gene pages. So, the old gene will really be in some of the And they're up and running. Um, Surface models, we'll see uh, this in just a second. So we've taken some of the service data. As you may know, in the original site, we did have interactive viewers for reading um, volumes. They were downsampled because of kind of a bandwidth and size constraints. These are very, very small compact files and they're reasonably easy to produce. So, um, so we are actually going back and recurating some of the older data, who is cranking on that. Um, so this is an example. These are all completely interactive. They're linked into the rest of the database. You can turn the services on and off. You can rotate around. We can also find landmarks on here. So the landmarks are not super fancy right now, but we do have them. Uh, you can turn all these on and off independently. So we think this will be really helpful. Again, these are uh, linked into the rest of the data. So they're not just computers that are just So it's easy on the side of that. So goes on to the uh, Look at the interesting thing. Genome browser, um, Santa Cruz browser, and then we're trying to push forward. We're using the JBrowse as well. This is an example of the initial integration of JBrowse. It's there, it works. We do a little bit more, so file charts for working on this. So the idea is for base based tracks, we will be able to look at them right in line. You won't have to pull off. It's a really beautiful browser. The, the presentation is very, very fast. Our presentation is very nice. Highly configurable, um, and eventually we'll be providing tighter integration and more links from the browser to the and so on. So you can click in one place and you'll show up another spot in the data set. Um, so we're quite um, um, excited about that. Uh, behind the scenes updates, I think I've mentioned we've done a significant amount of process engineering on uh, streamlining the creation process. Around November, we realized we were drowning. Uh, so we 
step back and look at the, the process and what it took to get a piece of data from when it showed up, when you gave it to us, to when it was available. And so we, we re-engineered our whole process and that seems to be working quite well now. We're keeping up and it's gonna get even better uh, for the data duration session tomorrow. I recommend everyone send somebody to that if you haven't signed up already. It's gonna be a whole bunch of new tools which hopefully you'll really like uh, and make your life even easier. Um, and then we've done a bunch of uh, kind of back-end upgrade. I guess the most uh, important thing is you can now, many of you use your campus credentials to log into Facebook. So, so you don't need to get a special account. You, you can just use your um, your uh, campus ID uh, if you're on part of this thing called Aid Common, uh, which many of you probably are. So um, yeah, so that's all been going on. Just then kind of a brief update for what we've got in, in, uh, in the pipeline. So uh, the uh, main things to look forward to over the coming 12 months are, uh, first of all, self-curation. Um, so again, I think we've got the tool in place where you're gonna be just kind of back and forth, which I know we're still having a little bit when you get a new data set. Um, we'll be able to eliminate that, it'll just be forth. Um, so there'll be online entry, we're putting in place an access control system, so each investigator can tune their own data and, and help um, you know, tune the metadata. We're gonna actually be able to eliminate the spreadsheet uploads, so you won't have to fill out the spreadsheets and mail them to us. You can automatically upload your files. So that should be, uh, we think that'll help. Um, we're gonna continue working on the Mesh browser, the service browser, um, do more work on landmarks. So I know there's an interest in having kind of measurements uh, within the within the um, browser and that can be done. Uh, we've done some preliminary work on heat maps for um, for the array data. Um, I think you know there's a lot of remaining questions as to exactly what we want to do with the array data and the RNA seq data that's coming in. Um, so we did some preliminary work on the heat maps. I would say it's not a technical question at this point. It's a scientific question as to what you really want. And so if we kind of work that out or what are the scientifically valid things to do uh, comparatively with the RNA-seq and the existing array data, um, we can make that available to the community. Um, again, that's, that's that. At JBrowse, we're gonna do continued work in, um, in uh, integrating that. And again, I think we need to understand better what people are gonna to wanna to do with this data. I believe there's a significant value add by us using JBrowse rather than just kicking people off to the Santa Cruz browser. We have a huge amount of flexibility as to what we can do with it. So I think a little bit of collective careful thinking, we can make that really compelling. Um, and uh, add to the user experience. Is there one more slide here? Oh yeah, one more slide. Um, we're going to spend more time um, improving the uh, presentation and usability of the data. So how can we do more specialized displays on the different data types? Because we're built on this kind of basic, very flexible platform, we can change presentation very, very rapidly. We can add specialized displays. There's all kinds of things we can do. So we'd like to make the, um, the, um, the presentation of the data better. And I would say also the integration. You know, where can we provide better value by making connections across different bespoke projects? Um, and along those lines, then augmenting the data set with non face based funded data assets that will bring value to the overall collection. So, we've already seen hints of that with what we're doing with Monarch. We can continue that work. We also had started a conversation with, with a group called DMDD which is a Wellcome Trust funded project in the UK that's doing these really beautiful um, uh, histology, 3D histology for something like 200 different uh, knockout mice and they're manually phenotyping everyone. So we're going to uh, pull out all the cranial facial and include that as well. We think that will be quite compelling. There's gonna be beautiful pictures though, so that'll augment this nicely. Uh, and then just general usability, improvement, performance, all the normal things. Uh, so that's the plan. And if there's time, since then, and so all our time. Oh, that's fine. Plenty of time. So then, you know, at this point, what I thought 
you would do is turn it over to Rob, and we can give you see it a little tour of kind of some of the new features and some of the interactions, and then ask questions. And uh, so that's the top. Any questions so far? All right. In that case, this is over to Rob. So we have a somewhat planned, but not necessarily a tour through uh, the current uh, data collection. So please, if you have questions or want to see something, shout it out. All right, I don't know if I have a mic or... Okay, so this mic doesn't... Yeah. I'm sure over here. See what see while I'm talking. Okay. Uh, all right. So just kind of starting at the top again uh, from the the features and the site. So as Carl mentioned, uh, we've done some revisions of the home page. Our focus it has been. Okay, really close. All right. Um, our focus has been on uh, uh, getting people into the browser and into the various data sets in a streamlined manner. So we begin here at the top. One of the things that we did, so uh, the, we found the, the got a lot of good feedback on the mouse matrix, and it was uh, it was very well received. And so what we did is we brought that into the home page. So before we had to. Uh, drill down a bit to get to it. And so this is just part of uh, surfacing more information immediately. And then you can drill down into the various data sets that are represented in the catalog itself. So we figured out how to get that embedded onto the home page is one of the, the things that we uh, um, focused on early on in the year. Um, as Carl mentioned, we now have, uh, in addition to the faceting interfaces that we have, where you can drill down from these various links on the home page, we added uh, along with that a listing of all of the new and pending data, as well as it's 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 everything ordered by the uh, release date. So you can drill down and and just see a quick listing of what is in the database at any time. And if I just uh, I'll go to one of the examples that we had a slide for, which is one of the new Alc Five uh, data sets. So. Uh, I go down into one of these, then we can take a look at the uh, uh, both the the the, uh, the 3D model, uh, one of the 3D models embedded on this, as well as the the new data structure that we have. So we start at the top with the familiar high-level information, title of the of the uh, data set, its description, and then we get into the new details that are available. So we're able to list highly detailed information on all of the samples on a per data set basis. Uh, and along with that, then the, the assay. So our typical page layout now starts with, with the general overview of the data set, then shows featured items like thumbnails, if we have them on that data set. So you can get a quick idea. Users can get a quick idea of, of what they're looking at, uh, incentive to download and use the data and uh, 3D models, things of that nature. And then you get down into the, the details of the description of it, which, which include the samples and then the assays. We have, a, of course, FaceSpace is a diverse consortium. So we have imaging assays. We have various uh, genomic assays and, and uh, transcriptomic assays. We have uh, the enhanced reporter assays and then clinical measures as well. Uh, for de-identified information that can be uh, shared on the site. So on each of the pages, you can drill down. And if we were to go into, say, uh, one of the particular samples here, I just drill down into that, then we can see additional information on the sample. And then we can see specifically which assay was associated with that. So this had a uh, micro CT imaging assay taken on this particular sample in the database. Uh, all of the terms, as Carl was mentioning in this presentation, are linked together. So 
when we drill down on a particular term here, we will see, let's, let's say we go into a particular strain, we will see all of the samples, not just from this data set, but from across the database, from a diverse set of projects of what exists in the database and what you can browse to. So we're, we put a lot of emphasis on being able to link together, integrate the data from across the consortium, be able to uh, navigate easily and find related items. That was another uh, important aspect of feedback that we got in the, the first uh, or this really the, over the course of the second year that we, that users wanted to see more of the related items. If they're looking at something of interest, what else might be similar to that? All right, let me just get back to the data set page. Here. Okay, and uh, we also mentioned that our project pages are now in the database. So we can get to all of the projects. We can search across the abstracts. So we have the full abstracts. And this tends to be useful because each of our projects are producing data that, uh, of course, that, that uh, comes out of a, a similar investigation that they're conducting. And the data that they're collecting over time is, uh, in many cases, a extended, uh, extended data set. So they may be working on a, a, a few uh, age stages and have released data, then on to a couple more age stages. And if uh, you want to follow that data, the easiest way to do that would be to go to one of their one of their projects. So you can go. I'll just drill down into uh, one of our projects here. Oh, this is an older one, but it probably has data down in here. Right, so we can get to all of the data sets now. So if you found uh, one particular project, and this was a face space one project, but you found one of interest, you can drill down and see all of the data sets that were re released for that. Uh, one of the things I would mention is that on each page, we show an aggregate summary of the information and, and there's more available. So you can kind of drill down into the view more, view more links, and then you get potentially pages of additional information, uh, typical paging approach. And then uh, if I wanted to see, get back to all of the data sets, I can just uh, eliminate the filter there and go back to the complete listing that's in base space. So we mentioned that we have uh, done some curation of the phenotype summaries. So let me go down into the phenotypes here. So we have all of the phenotypes that have been uh, identified as of interest to the consortium. So this includes a listing. We've aligned this with the mammalian phenotype ontology and the human phenotype ontology, uh, as well as the, uh, of course, the OCDM terms. I'll drill down into the uh, small maxilla here. All right, so this was one that uh, Carl showed there on the, the slide. So, and as Carl mentioned, we've done our initial integration here with the Monarch Initiative. So they have very nice curated resources on a particular phenotype here. So we can see their record for this particular mammalian phenotype term. So this is an MP term for small maxilla. We can see where it where it rests within the the context of other MP terms. If we wanted to see narrower, narrower or broader terms, we can do that here. We can also, we can also navigate to some uh, additional very nice information on genes that are related, genotypes, variants. We can see uh, disease information. So all of this information is, uh, it's a very rich set of information. It's uh, available, integrated into the site. As Carl mentioned, we're gonna do more part of our plans for the next year will be deeper integration with this data and bringing more of it directly into the database. But right now you can browse to it and learn more on each of these terms. And again, these are linked to each of the data sets. So if you're on a data set, you see a term there, wanna learn more, more about it, you can drill down into that phenotype term and then see all of the resources that are provided externally at the Monarch Initiative. Let's see, for the gene summary, I think that 
let's see, the, the gene summary, uh, one thing I wanted to show there. Okay, so as Carl mentioned again, now the, the these summaries that were produced in Phase Space 1 and also produced uh, some new ones out of uh, uh, the Chai Lab recently. So one of the things of the, the, that made this possible was additional developments on the infrastructure that the hub uses. So all of these displays are actually rendered in a in, in a language that's kind of like a what you would use on a wiki kind of site. And it's integrated into the browser and we expect to have more of this rich displays of information throughout our, our database moving forward. And this is just one example of that. So we actually have the ability to bring in this kind of uh, curated display of information into the data set descriptions, for instance. So if you're a spoke and you're producing data, you have uh, a lot more flexibility with how you want to lay out information, putting uh, images and tables into your descriptions and, and really enhance what people find when they get to your, your particular data sets. And let's take a look at a live view of one of the one of the uh, the 3D renderers. Go to one that has uh, has a few structures in it, so we can see that. This is from a data set that's now available from the Fisher Lab. And here we have uh, a surface model generated from confocal imaging. And we have uh, the ability to drill down and, and see what types of, uh, well, whoops, got to get used to the scrolling on here, sorry. All right, so we can take a look at the individual files that generated this. We can actually link these directly into the anatomical terms. So one of the things that you'll see over the coming year is that when we have these models, the, we'll, we'll be able to annotate them with links back to the anatomical regions. And then uh, it's, this is actually technically possible now, but just a matter of curating some new data to be able to then go from one of these links back to those terminology, terminology pages and see the other data that's available for that anatomical source. And some of the nice features here, we can change the opacity of different uh, regions here. We can set things to automatically rotate uh, by default if someone chose to do that. We can slice into an image. I'll just turn the rotation off while I do that. We can slice into it with a little clipping plane dynamically. So there are a lot of new features that we'll be able to do with this and display the information that we've been collecting so far. We have uh, a couple of these models curated to date with, a, uh, with many more planned to come. So over the next few months, we should see many more of these showing up within the database. The last item, oh yes, and then, the, uh, then we wanted to take a, look, a live look at the genome browser itself. And here, yes, so uh, I'll just go to a record I'm familiar with. All right, so again, with the, the new integrated genome browser. So as Carl mentioned, there's a lot of configuration that we can do with this. And uh, that's one of the, the tasks for the coming year will be to do a lot more to, to uh, to configure it so that out of the box, it comes uh, with a lot of information and uh, and uh, we can also customize it so that when you drill down to a particular data sets embedded browser that we're on just the right uh, browsing location. So here I have to kind of poke around a little bit, but as we can see, it's a, it's a pretty responsive browser. So uh, we've been, Fairly happy with the performance we see out of it. I will uh, just mention before I jump to the next page that we continue to have links to the UCSC genome browser. 
we continue to support that with uh, all of our new data sets that are coming out and see that as a uh, very good channel for, you can think of it as a, a good channel for face-based data. And obviously we see a, a, a fairly robust traffic from that site. But here I'll open up in a separate window. So we have the embedded browser. And you're able to jump to a, a, a new window and be able to get a, uh, have a little more real estate to browse around with the data sets. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a tour of all of the new features. Um, anything else that uh, we haven't covered? I think uh, that pretty much hits all the major points there on the side. I think that's it. Uh, on the genome browser, kind of the other thing to, to note is that <clears throat> as part of our self-curation tools, um, and also with the with the images that there's actually no hidden magic there. There are, are interfaces that are available to the investigators to add their own annotations, uh, like what colors and how you want things labeled. So for the genome browser, um, it's not there now, but very soon you'll be able to say, well, when this comes up, I want this chromosome. I want it zoomed in here. So we'll have the ability for you to curate your your uh, sequence data however you would like. Um, so that's going to be coming. And as, as Rob added, uh, this is not quite an end state. So for example, we don't have the gene names on there. And uh, so there's some other kind of low-hanging fruit that we're going to put in place on this uh, and right after this meeting that will we'll bring it up to, uh, you know, we think an acceptable level. Uh, our goal here is not to necessarily replace the track hub. We want to look across a lot of things and do detailed track hub annotations and look across species and other reference sequences. We most likely won't support that, but we'll go to the track hub and do that. And we're going to focus here on the face-based data and making that more enriched. So that'll be our, our goal there. Uh, and we think that's a reasonable trade-off. So, that's pretty much it. Um, hopefully what you're seeing here is that, and, and maybe one takeaway for data contributors and anyone in the community, we are in a position now to start taking in lots of types of data, um, cranial facial data, much more streamlined and much more rapidly. The granularity at which we're taking the data is much finer than maybe you're a little bit used to. So, um, uh, I'm sure we've had conversations with some of you already where you want to give us a roll up where everything's on one page and we go back and say, no, no, give it to us in a bunch of separate uh, files, separate figures, separate pages. Um, and the motivation for that is because, as you can see, when we have things at kind of these elemental, you know, one piece of anatomy for one age stage, for one gene, then we can link things together in much more compelling ways and provide more useful information to the user community. So kind of a, the thing we're going to ask you is think about how you can disaggregate your data to the maximum extent possible so the users get to glue it together in new ways rather than us telling them how to glue it together. Anyway, that's it. This is all the production site, right? So everything you saw is actually live. All the new data is there. There will be new features coming out. Um, I think, you know, overall, I'm pretty pleased. Um, we had a lot of work by Rob and Chris, Alejandro, Kyle, who, a bunch of others back there. Who did I forget? Anyway, so that's it. Any other questions? Yeah, so there's two ways that we can do this. One is um, we could we could put on, we could do tutorial, we could do online um, training. The other thing that I think is because we haven't spent a lot of time in configuration, it's possible we can configure it so it looks closer to the Santa Cruz browser than it currently does. So those are three options. You know, one of the things that again we can put this question back to the community, which is. Um, uh, we're not geneticists. Uh, we think it looks kind of slick, but what do you really want to do with this, right? So is it useful to have all those additional reference tracks when you come to the Santa Cruz browser? You know, it gives you all this other stuff. Right? Is that really useful? Do you want that stuff here? Or is it just cluttering you end up turning it off? So I think we'd like to understand, you know, the niche we're trying to fill here. 
and then we can set things up so that it responds to that niche. Um, again, there's a million knobs and, and you know levers on this thing, so it's got a huge amount of flexibility. So we need input. This is our first cut. It's very flexible. So give us guidance as to what would be useful, and we can we can make it useful. And we will do tutorials too, of course. There's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of data out there, which is also not in face space from other annotations such as MGI and so on that came about. Is there any effort to try to link it up to that? The problem is that, of course, those data sets are not annotated at all at the same level of depth. And would, would there be a way to link it? Uh, yeah, so there's a kind of a two phase strategy to that. So if you look at what we're doing with uh, DMDD, that's exactly what we're planning on doing is taking that data, uh, uh, aligning the annotations, the phenotype and anatomical annotations that they have, which maybe won't be as detailed, and then integrating. And then our approach is going to be twofold, uh, depending on kind of value proposition. So one is to take that data wholesale and put it in our site, which is probably what we're going to do with DMDD because it'll improve the user experience. We can get it more tightly integrated and they're completely open to doing that with us. The other is to provide external linkages, which is, okay, here's a place where, you know, go to Jack's Labs and get it. And here's the link. And we've done that as well. And so we'll continue to take both strategies as to what makes sense. But our view is that the utility of the face space hub is that it's a curated set of data related to cranial facial and um, it doesn't have to have all the data or we don't have to collect it all. So how can we drive value by that integration? So just for clarification, um, I just the correct plan is to continue with the UTC track map in parallel to maintain a browse where JBrowse would be the primary viewer within space space. Uh, yeah. But so moving forward, we plan to put all new data sets both into the JBrowse and the track map. Okay. okay. So, so first of all, I think that would be a great idea because I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have record. For example, I've used the UCC browser a lot and then very many good features in that one. But so my question would be, um, if you want to use both in parallel moving forward, will you have a mechanism where new data sets that they get submitted, um, get submitted into both and we have a streamlined process that doesn't double the workload at your end up in for maintaining both of them in parallel? Right. We need to work out the mechanisms in more detail because we're just starting. So it's no more work for you. It's our job to make sure things get into the track hub. We run a local track hub in FaceSpace. So the track hub files are being served from the FaceSpace server now. And our job will be to run the run the tools to get the, the data available both in track hub and from JBrowse. Why not just, just look at this since like, there are different names in the track hub and JBrowse, right? So just like some of the new data, at least from our project, some of the new ones we do the JBrowse, the old ones are still in the track hub. So there's no really no mechanism yet to sync both. Well, right? I think that's just an artifact of how early this is. Okay. There's I, I think moving forward, there's uh, really uh, no additional workload on us really to put it in both. It's it's fairly trivial to organize it. It's just a little, I mean, it's the same data, different metadata format to generate the track list. I mean, Kyle Char is the one who's worked out this process, but you can you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but it's, uh, um, it's no additional workload for us to generate the track list for both. As far as why, so we haven't moved all of the base space one tracks into the JBrowse yet, and that's something that we'll be evaluating. I, again, I don't think that's very, I don't think that's all that difficult, but I think we'll need to look at, that's kind of wrapped up in, in how much of the curation we can do of base space one data, which as Carl mentioned, we're, uh, 
we don't have, that's not a priority to go back to the face-to-face -face one data. But I think we can look at the track hub data and perhaps move that over as well. So it appears in bulk. But certainly moving forward, any of the new data, I don't think it really adds, it, it hasn't looked like it adds really any additional workload to us. So I don't think you're going to see a big lag between the two. Oops, Steve had a question. Steve gets to ask two questions. But that's it, you're at your limit. <laughs> Again, we could set this up pretty much any way we want. The way we've configured, and this is really our first cut of this, the way we've configured this right now is browsing of track on a per project basis. We can do roll ups and cross cuts. It's um, so again, just ah, tell, tell us what's going to be useful, right? So, what kinds of questions do you, do you think people are going to want answered and when they come in? Um, what kinds of, and then kind of the reason for doing this is we can contextualize the, the track information with the other information in face space. So, we should be thinking about how we want to mix these up. You know, what's the mashup we want? How do we want it presented? And then, again, I think there's a, a huge amount of flexibility. We have more than enough rope to hang ourselves with. So, you know, I think we should be kind of a little bit creative in thinking about what would be the most compelling presentation and organization of the data. And, you know, then we can, we can do that. Um, so, and again, I, I think... And if the best answer is, well, this is organized already this way on, on uh, track hub, just use track hub. Well, that's, I think, fine too. Um, and I think where we're going to, in terms of our resources, I think where I'm going to, I'm saying this without a lot of experience or knowledge at this point, I think where we're going to draw the line is when normally in track hub, where you would sit down and start writing these custom annotation files, and you know you can do a lot of configuration in track hub by writing all this extra food. I think my proposal is that we're going to write that extra stuff so it works in JBrowse rather than invest writing that so it works in track hub. Um, so I think that's how we're going to make the decision because, again, we can get, I think, a more, uh, a more kind of modern and compelling experience and better linkage with our data if we do it in, 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 in this tool. But all the basic stuff you get in track hub will still be there. Right. So that's that's the real question is is if that's the use case to compare against non face space or non face space data, then at that point, I would say, you know what, maybe the Santa Cruz browser is the right tool, because I'm not sure if you want to be in the business of pulling in. Exactly. Exactly. So I think, you know, right now, the thesis is it's useful to look at face space data kind of by itself uh, in a deep dive way highly configured for face space. And then if you want to do this comparative, uh, more comparative stuff, look all across all the hubs, all that other, uh, then yeah, go there because that's the best place for that. But if all you go in is you go in and you just look at data that's in the face space uh, hub, the track hub, then, you know, and you're not availing yourselves to all the other data there, then maybe that's an, that's an experience we can do a better job at delivering. Than just sending you over to the track hub. So that's that's the trade-off. It's still a, it's still very much a work in progress. Um, and you know, input on that would be would be welcome as to what's going to be useful, what you'd like to see. Um, again, I think the the value here is that the ability to you know, for example, look at a gene in the browser, click on that, and boom, you're on the gene summary page, or you see all the all the images we have for that gene, or or what have you. So that's I think the, the the better experience, the more integrated view of the data that would be very space space specific that we could leverage that would be more difficult to do in the Santa Cruz browser. So um, that's what we're thinking. 
So this is related to that comment, but maybe flip the idea around and have it UCSC plug in the basement. So they have mechanisms where they go out to create, uh, they go out to other databases, you click on the link and it goes back to where you need to go. And so be able to integrate with UCSC in that regard. So once you get to a gene, you have a button, go to Facebook. Right, yeah. So we've looked a bit at those mechanisms as well. Um, so that's, uh, I think, something we'll continue to look at also. That's it. Thank you. As you can appreciate it, none of this would be impossible without the uh, support from our funding agency. And we have NIDCR really well represented here. We have our director, Martha Summerman, and Steve Skolnick, uh, and also Emily Harris. Did I miss any? Katie is here. And so uh, now I want to invite Martha to uh, come up and just give us some comments about our face space. Thank you. 